The story of Kristen Smart's disappearance in 1996 is also the story of two families. One family grief-stricken but determined to find their daughter and to seek justice for what happened to her. The other family equally determined to go to great lengths to shield their son from any consequences of his actions. After delays, lost evidence, and memories withering over the span of nearly 25 years, the two families continued circling each other in what seemed a never-ending and unequal duel. But sometimes, hope is worth holding on to. One family raised a promising, bright individual. The other family raised a loser. And losers, well, eventually they tend to do just that. They lose. Today's case was recommended by one of my wonderful subscribers, Justice4, who always suggests really good cases for me to cover. And I have selected this reference picture to sketch from today because to me it just really represents a moment of complete and candid happiness in her life and that's how I think we should remember her. Stan and Denise Smart missed the call made to their home on Friday the 24th of May 1996, but they later retrieved a voice message from their answering machine. It was from Kristen, their 19-year-old firstborn daughter. She was calling them from her dorm at Cal Poly University and said she had good news and would share it with them later that weekend. She had been having a hard time all freshman year and she'd spoken to her parents about relocating and possibly even going to study in Puerto Rico. She had already switched majors from architecture to communications, but she still felt out of place. At face value, this voice message seemed to indicate that she was at least feeling more positive. But she never got to tell them her good news. And when the phone did ring, it wasn't Kristen, but the police. The Smarts were a close-knit family, Kristen had been born in Germany on the 20th of February, 1977, while her parents were both working there as teachers. They returned after about three years. Kristen was also close to her younger siblings. Her mother reports that when her brother was born, unlike a lot of toddlers who would become instantly jealous of the newcomer, Kristen instead was a proud big sister and just loved her baby brother. Kristen grew up to be tall, pretty, very sporty, and a talented artist. Friends reported that she drew very detailed house plans and she had planned to become an architect. She had a mild case of ADD, but she worked hard to ensure she got into college and could pursue her dreams of conquering the world. She truly loved to travel. She spent time in Venezuela as an exchange student, visited friends in London, and the summer before she disappeared, she worked as a camp counsellor in Hawaii. When she changed majors, she voiced her desire to become a journalist and to travel the world. She was described as shy in unfamiliar situations, but with an ever-present inner confidence. She took on a lot. Even as a freshman in college, she didn't shy away from extra responsibilities. She worked as a lifeguard and had to get up at 4.30 a.m. for some of her shifts, a tall order for most students. Whether it was because it was Memorial Day weekend or because she just wanted to blow off some steam from a difficult semester behind her, Kristen was determined to find a party and have some fun that Friday night after she made the call to her parents. She convinced a few friends to accompany her, but as they searched for a party and the night dragged on, her friends got tired and they told Kristen they just wanted to go back to the dorm. But she was determined. So one friend gave Kristen her dorm key and they left her close to the address where a birthday party was taking place just off campus. At just after 10.30, Kristen walked into the party alone. A number of other students were at the party that night. Cheryl Anderson, Tim Davis and Paul Flores were among them. Kristen reportedly kissed at least one guy at the party. So, pretty standard college student stuff. Allegedly, witnesses saw Paul Flores on top of Kristen in the hallway at one point, 
perhaps after crashing into her. But it really seemed innocent, according to them, and they said that both Kristen and Paul were laughing about it as they got up from the floor. Paul was then later chased away from a group of students when he was trying to hit on a girl in front of her boyfriend. Reportedly, he hit on a few women that night and wouldn't take no for an answer, forcing many of them to seek refuge with friends. In the early hours of the morning of the 25th of May, the partygoers started making their way to their various homes. Cheryl Anderson was being walked home by Tim Davis when she spotted Kristen lying on the grass outside. Kristen seemed either inebriated or drugged, and she seemed cold, she was shivering, and she was struggling to walk. Cheryl pulled her to her feet and told Tim they would walk Kristen home too. The trio then got another addition. Paul Flores joined them and put his arm around Kristen as they walked to the dorms. Tim then broke free when they got closer to where he had parked his car and he said goodnight. Reportedly, as Cheryl, Paul, and Kristen walked further, Paul would stop numerous times and he would tell Cheryl to just go ahead without them. She thought this was strange, but she insisted that he catch up with her. Paul's dorm was closer to Kristen's than Cheryl's was. When they reached the road to Cheryl's dorm, Paul said he would see Kristen to her dorm safely. He then allegedly asked Cheryl for a kiss. She said she was repulsed and she said no. He then asked her for a hug and she also refused and she left. She didn't look back and that was the last time anyone, aside from Paul Flores, saw Kristen. The next day, Kristen's roommate came back from having been away from campus the day before. And she noticed that Kristen's stuff was spread out on the bed like it would be before going out for a night, so it didn't appear that she had slept in her bed the night before. When Kristen had still not been seen by anyone on Sunday, her roommate began to worry. She called campus police, trying to convince them that something was really wrong. On Monday, campus police finally called Kristen's home in Stockton, California. Her mother, Denise, answered, expecting it to be Kristen. The police asked if Kristen was with them, and she said no. They immediately started making plans to search. Kristen's father, Stan, managed to get time off work so he could arrive on campus that Tuesday to speak to campus police and to search for his daughter. Two attempts by the smarts to file a missing persons report that day was resisted by police, who told them it was too soon. Weeks later, the initial missing persons report was finally written up by Cal Poly police and allegedly contained the statement, Denise Smart states that her daughter went on a camping trip. This was blatantly false. Was it a misunderstanding? Or was it an attempt to shift blame? I guess we'll never know for sure. Police also finally started to interview students to find out who last had contact with Kristen. And this led them to Paul Flores. Paul showed up to the police interview with a black eye. When asked how he got it, he said he got it by getting hit with an elbow while he was playing basketball. But when they asked his friend, who supposedly was playing basketball with him, he said Paul already had the black eye when he arrived, and that he had also asked about it, and that Paul told him he had just woken up like that. A likely story. Paul then changed his story and said he bumped it on the steering wheel of his truck. So of course, police were immediately suspicious, and they cordoned off his dorm room to look for evidence, right? Of course not. Cleaning crews were permitted to go in and actually sanitize Paul's room, because he had moved out for the summer. Police took so long to ask for records of all the calls made from the dorms that night, that by the time they asked, the university had already deleted them. It seemed that perhaps Paul might have made a call in the early hours of the 25th to the one person he knew he could trust, his father, Reuben. Paul's mother, Susan, allegedly made a flippant comment to her colleague later that day, saying that her husband had gotten a call that morning and left the house like a bat out of hell. So it seems that Paul's mother didn't have knowledge of what had transpired, at least at this stage. 
Paul Flores had a history of problematic behavior with women. On the brilliant podcast, Your Own Backyard, Chris Lambert interviews a number of women from Paul's past, and they all have unsettling stories about him. The recollections range from harassment and stalking to sexual assault. He had various nicknames, from Scary Paul to Chester the Molester. And this was the 90s. Stories of Anita Hill, Paula Jones, and the tailhook scandal would have dominated the media in years before Kristen went missing. Women who reported sexual harassment were not treated kindly. And while some of these women said they had characterized Paul as harmless, that's clearly not how they really felt, because nobody was surprised when they heard of his involvement in Kristen's disappearance. In the years since Kristen disappeared, multiple brave women have approached police and reported that Paul had sexually assaulted them, but nothing was done. He was coddled by not only the system, but by his parents. One ex-colleague remembers that Paul's parents arrived at their place of work one day. She said they brought food for everyone, and she got the distinct impression that they really wanted Paul to fit in and make friends. It was said that his mother appeared very timid, and that Paul was rude to her. But again, it seems he could treat women any way he wanted, and he didn't have to face any consequences for it. His parents never seemed to recognize that Paul might be the common denominator, not only in his unlikability, but also his mediocre performance at school. Before he was named a suspect, his parents admitted to investigators that he had no friends in high school, and that they had actually bought him a pool table in the hopes that it would attract kids to their house so that he could, quote, have someone to talk to. At Cal Poly, Paul had been studying food sciences and was failing every single one of his classes, except for an elective in bowling, which was pass-fail. He got into the university despite having appalling grades. Every event in his life seemed to build on the notion that Paul Flores didn't have to play by the rules, and he could still get away with whatever he wanted. The campus police finally decided that this case was too complex for them, and they involved the sheriff's department. Just kidding. They called the district attorney. The sheriff's department would have had the manpower and the resources to start a thorough investigation, but for some unknown and inexplicable reason, the district attorney was called first. Initially, Paul actually agreed to submit to a polygraph test, but he kept postponing it, putting it off, making excuses. So finally, the district attorney's investigators picked him up and told him it's time for the test. But he then refused. He did, however, agree to an interview. During this interview, he told investigators that he had gone to the dormitory showers at 5 a.m. because he had become sick. They asked him why he changed his story about the black eye and scratches found on him. He responded that he didn't think it was important because he didn't want to seem like a klutz. They kept pressing him for answers. Finally, he snapped and said, If you're so smart, tell me where the body is. Then he walked out. Where the body is has been a much-discussed topic. It was reported that two days after Kristen disappeared, a witness saw the Flores family pouring concrete behind one of the homes they own. They owned two homes, and at that point, one they lived in and one they were renting out. Paul's roommate joked with him about what he did with Kristen, and Paul's response is chilling. It was something to the effect of, she's at home with my parents. But how was the body moved in the first place? Paul Flores' dorm room was one on the ground floor with nearby dumpsters, so some think that this is how he moved her body, but searches of landfalls have turned up nothing. Three items were reported stolen from the Cal Poly campus that weekend. An electric golf cart and two car covers stolen off vehicles. Some speculate that her body may have been wrapped in the car covers and transported in the golf cart, which would be relatively quiet 
and able to navigate terrain that other vehicles can't without drawing attention. Students later said they took a cart for a joyride that weekend, but we don't know the truth of that. Two things we know that are suspicious is that Paul Flores had access to golf carts via his job on campus, and that when the golf cart was returned to campus, a few students who worked in the maintenance department were ordered by their supervisor to wash down the cart, which they thought was odd because the cart appeared clean. And when the students took too long to wash it, the supervisor began scrubbing it down himself. This was reported by one of the students years after the fact. It's also possible that Paul eventually used his truck to move the body. Months had passed before investigators finally asked to inspect Paul's pickup truck. But lo and behold, Paul said his pickup truck had been stolen, even though it didn't appear that he had ever reported this theft. A month after Kristen's disappearance, and after Paul's dorm room had already been cleaned, the sheriff's department finally got involved. They got a team of dog handlers and trained cadaver dogs to the dormitories. The four cadaver dogs independently alerted to Paul Flores' room. They alerted to the mattress, the wastebasket, and to the phone. The way this cadaver dog search was handled is truly how every cadaver dog search should be handled. I have to say that this part of the investigation was conducted very professionally. The handlers were given no information about the case. This is because if the handler knows what specific room or area there is interest in, there is a high likelihood that they will inadvertently signal this to their highly perceptive dog, which will skew the results. The dogs and handlers were brought in one by one, independently and at different times, to also avoid them influencing each other. And the wastebasket was removed from the room and placed next to identical wastebaskets to double check the dog's response. On the 15th of July, what can really only loosely be described as a search was conducted at Ruben Flores' home. No cadaver dogs were brought in, no vehicles were confiscated or even searched. They found news clippings of stories covering Kristen's disappearance underneath the bed. The tenant leasing the other property belonging to the Flores family came forward to the sheriff's department to hand in an earring she had found outside. For some reason, this information was not shared with the Smart family until they heard about it in a court deposition. The description of the earring matched Kristen's favorite pair of earrings, earrings that were never found and she was presumed to have worn the night she was last seen. When the Smarts asked the sheriff's office to see the earring, they were told that it had been misplaced. The same tenant also reported hearing an alarm going off at 4.20 every morning. Kristen had the alarm on her wristwatch set to wake her up at that time to go to her lifeguard shift. In November of 1997, the Smarts filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Paul. During a break in deposition proceedings, Denise Smart was overcome with emotion. She found an empty conference room and sat down and wept. She wept with grief for her missing child, for the knowledge that she would never see her again, and for the void in their family. Ruben Flores followed her. He opened the door and stared at her for a few moments. Then he laughed. Denise also tried to plead with Susan, mother to mother. She sent her photos of Kristen. Allegedly, Susan simply responded coldly with, I don't want to see pictures of your daughter. The Flores family countersued the Smarts for so-called emotional distress. The entire case was eventually dismissed due to the ongoing investigation. Kristen Smart was declared legally dead in 2002. Twice, Paul's attorneys presented plea bargains to the Smarts. In return for information about Kristen, Paul wanted to be assured he would get no jail time. But the deals fell through. Paul had to pay. In June of 2000, the police finally searched the other property, the one where the earring was found. 
Susan Flores was living there at that time. They didn't use cadaver dogs, and they didn't excavate the yard. They used ground-penetrating radar, which was new technology at that time, and was not as effective as it is today. In 2006, a contractor contacted the Smart family to say that Susan had contacted him to give her a bid on building an arbor in her backyard, up against the existing house. He had never heard back, but when he was on site to do some other work, he noticed that the new arbor was already built, with a brand new concrete slab. In 2007, another search took place. The Flores family agreed to it, provided that only one section of the property was searched. And, surprisingly, nothing was found on that area of the property. In 2016, the campus grounds were searched, but nothing but animal bones were found. In 2019, the podcast Your Own Backyard gained popularity. Chris Lambert was inspired by Kristen's billboard to start the podcast. The podcast was credited for attracting renewed interest to the case. He spoke to brand new witnesses, such as a foreign exchange student from Australia, who saw what could have been Kristen and Paul in a tussle near to where Cheryl had left them that night. In April of 2020, a new search warrant was issued, and items of interest were recovered at Paul's home. In March of 2021, another search was executed at the home of Ruben Flores. Susan Flores commented later to the media that her son is innocent and she hopes the smarts get their answers. Well, I'm not a genie, but wish granted, Susan, because I am beyond thrilled to report that Paul will finally have his day in court. On April the 13th, Paul and Ruben Flores were taken into custody. Paul was charged with murder and Ruben as an accessory after the fact. Prosecutors believe Paul took Kristen to his dorm room, which he had to himself that night, and tried to rape her. She fought back, and he killed her. At this time, they have not found her body yet. It took 25 years, but this case gives me hope for all the other missing people and Jane and John Doe's out there, some of whose stories I've covered or will still cover. Let's not give up on them. This case shows us just how important citizen attention and action can be in these cases. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.